Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Caesars in Las Vegas. My name is Dave Vellante. We're here with the chairman and CEO of Snowflake, Frank Slootman. Good to see you again, Frank. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, you, you as well, Dave. Good to you be know, with you. It's, it's awesome to be, obviously, everybody's excited to be back. You mentioned that in your, in your keynote. The most amazing thing to me is the progression of what we're seeing here in the ecosystem and of your data cloud. Um, you wrote a book, The Rise of the Data Cloud, and it was very cogent. You talked about network effects, but now you've executed on that. I call it the super cloud. You have AWS, you know I use that term. AWS, you're building on top of that, and now you have customers building on top of your cloud. So there's these layers of value. That's unique in the industry. Was this by design? <laughs> well, you know, when you uh, are a data cloud and you have data, people want to do things you know, with that data. They don't want to just you know, run data operations, populate dashboards, you know, run reports. Pretty soon they want to build applications. And after they build applications, they want to build businesses on it. So it goes on and on and on. So it, it drives your development to enable more and more functionality on that data cloud. It didn't start out that way. You know, we were very, very much focused on data operations. Then it becomes application development, and then it becomes, hey, we're developing whole businesses on this platform. Sort of similar to what happened to Facebook in many, in many ways. You know? There was some confusion, I think, and there still is in the community, uh, particularly on Wall Street, about your quarter, your con the consumption model. I loved, on the earnings call, one of the analysts asked Mike, you know, do you ever consider going to a subscription model? And Mike got cut him off, didn't let him finish. No, that would really defeat the purpose. Um, and so, there's also a narrative around, well, maybe Snowflake consumption's easier to dial down. Maybe it's more discretionary, but I, I would say this, that if you're building apps on top of Snowflake and you're actually monetizing, which is a big theme here, now your revenue is aligned you know, with those cloud costs. And so unless you're selling it for more, you know, than it, it costs more than, than you're selling it for, you're going to dial that up. And that is the future of I see this ecosystem in your company. Is that, is that fair, you buy that? Yeah, it, it is fair. Obviously, the public cloud runs on a consumption model, so you, know, you start looking at all the layers of the stack. Um, you know, Snowflake, you know, I mean, we have to be a consumption model because we run on top of other people's uh, consumption models, otherwise you don't have alignment. I mean, we have conversations uh, with people that build on Snowflake, um, you know, they have trouble, you know, with their financial model because they're not running a consumption model. So it's like square peck in a round hole. So we all have to align ourselves so that when they pay a dollar, you know, a portion goes to, let's say, AWS, a portion goes to Snowflake of that dollar, and a portion goes to whatever the uplift is, application value, data value, whatever it is that, that goes on top of that. So the whole dollar, you know, gets allocated depending on whose value added um, we're talking about. Yeah, but you sell value. Um, so you're not a SaaS company, uh, at least I don't look at you that, that way. I, I've always felt like the SaaS pricing model is flawed because it's not aligned with customers, right? If you, if you get stuck with orphaned licenses, too bad, you know, pay yeah, us. Yeah, we're, we're, we're obviously a SaaS model in the sense that it is software as a service, but it's not a SaaS model in the sense that we don't sell use rights. Right, and that's the big difference. When, when you buy, you know, so many users from, you know, Salesforce or ServiceNow or whoever, you have just purchased the right, you know, for so many users to use that software for this period of time, and uh, the revenue gets recognized, you know, ratably, you know, one month at a time, the same amount. Now we're not that different because we still do a contract the exact same way a SaaS vendor does it, but we don't recognize the revenue ratably. We recognize the revenue based on the consumption, but over the term of the contract, we recognize the entire amount. It's just it's not neatly organized in these monthly buckets. You know? So what happens if they underspend one quarter? They have to catch up uh, by the end of the, the term? Is that how it works or is that a negotiation? Or? The, the, the spending is a totally, totally separate from the consumption itself, you know, because, you know, how they pay for the contract. Let's say they do a three-year contract. Um, you know, they, they will probably pay for that. You know, on an annual basis. You know, that three-year contract. Um, but it's how they recognize their expenses for Snowflake, and how we recognize the revenue is based on what they actually consume. But it's not like you're on demand where you can just decide to not use it, and then I don't have any cost. But over the three-year period, you know, all of that you know uh, needs to get consumed, or they expire. And it's the same way with Amazon. If I don't consume what I buy from Amazon, I still got to pay for it, you know, so. <laughs> well, you're right. Well, you, I guess you could buy by the drink, but it's way, way more expensive and nobody really Correct. does that. So, yep. okay, phase one, better, simpler, you know, cloud, enterprise data warehouse. Phase two, you introduced the, the data cloud. 
and, and now we're seeing the rise of the data cloud. What, what does phase three look like? Now, phase, phase three is all about applications. Um, and we've just learned uh, you know, from the beginning that people were trying to do this, but we weren't instrumented at all uh, to do it. So people would ODBC, you know, JDBC drivers, just use this as a database, right? So the entire application would happen outside of you know, Snowflake. We're just a database. You connect to the database, you, know, you read or write data, you, know, you do data, uh, data manipulations, and then the application uh, processing all happens outside of Snowflake. Now there's issues with that because we start to exfiltrate data, meaning that we start to take data out of Snowflake and, and put it uh, in other places. Now there's a risk with that. There's operational risk, there's governance exposure, security issues, you know, all this kind of stuff. And the other problem is you know, data gets re-siloed, it proliferates, and then you know, data scientists are like, well, I, I need that data to stay in one place. That's the whole idea behind the data cloud. You know, we have very big infrastructure clouds, we have very big application clouds, and then data you know, sort of became the victim there and became more proliferated and more segmented than it's ever been. So all we do is just send data to the work all day, and we said, no, we're going to enable the work to get to the data, and the data just stays in one place. We don't have latency issues, we don't have data quality issues, we don't have lineage issues. So you know, people have responded very, very well to the data cloud idea. It's like, yeah, you know, as an enterprise or an institution, you know, I'm the epicenter of my own data cloud because it's not just my own data, it's also my ecosystem. It's the people that I have data networking relationships with. You know, for example, you know, take you know, uh, an investment bank you know, in, in, in New York City. They send data to Fidelity, they send data to BlackRock, they send data to you know, Bank of New York, all the regulatory clearing houses, all on and on and on. You know, every night they're running thousands, tens of thousands you know, of jobs pushing that data you know, out there. It just, and they all, they're all on Snowflake already, so we, it doesn't have to be this way, right? So. Yes, so I, I asked the guys before, you know, last week, hey, uh, what, what would you ask Frank? Now you might remember, uh, you came on uh, our program during COVID, and I was asking you how you're dealing with it, turn off the news, and it was, that was cool. And I asked you at the time, you know, will you ever you know, go on-prem? And you said, look, I'll never say never, but it defeats the purpose, and you said, we're not going to do a halfway house. Actually, you were more de declarative. We're not doing a halfway house, one foot in, one foot out. And then the guy said, well, what about that Dell deal and that Pure deal that you just did? And I, I, I think I know the answer, but I want to hear from you. Did a customer come to you and say, get you in a headlock and say, you got to do this, or? It, it didn't happen that way. Uh, it, uh, it started with a conversation, um, you know, I had with, uh, with Michael Dell. Um, it, it was supposed to be just a friendly chat, you know, hey, how's it going? And, I mean, obviously Dell is the owner of Data Domain, our, our first company, you know. Um, but it's, it wasn't easy for, for Dell and Snowflake to have a conversation because they're the epitome of the on-premise company and we're the epitome of a cloud company. And it's like, how, how, what do we have in common here, right? What can we talk about? But, you know, Michael's a very smart, uh, engaging guy, you know, always looking for, for opportunity. And of course, he decides, we're going to hook up our CTOs, our product teams, and, you know, explore, you know, some of these uh, ideas. And, you know, yeah, we had some, you know, starts and restarts and all of that because it's just naturally, you know, uh, not an easy thing to conceive of. But, you know, in the end, it was like, you know what? It makes a lot of sense, you know, we can virtualize, you know, Dell object storage, you know, as if it's, you know, an S3 storage, you know, from Amazon. And then, you know, Snowflake in its analytical processing will just reference that data because to us it just looks like a file that's sitting on, on S3. And we have, we have such a thing, it's called an external table, right? That's, that's how we, basically it projects, you know, a Snowflake uh, semantic and structural model you know, on an external object, and we process against it exactly the same way as if it was an internal uh, table. So we just extended that, um, you know, with, um, with our storage partners like Dell and Pure Storage um, for it to happen, you know, across the network to an on-premise place. So it's very elegant, and it, it, uh, it becomes an, uh, an enterprise architecture rather than just a cloud architecture. And I'm, I just don't know what will come of it, and, but I've already talked to customers who have to have data on premise. They just can't go anywhere because they process against it, you know, where it originates. But and there are analytical processes that want to reference attributes of that data. Well, this is what will do that. Yeah, I'm, it's interesting. I, I'm going to ask Dell, if I were them, I'd be talking to you about, hey, I'm going to try to separate compute from storage on-prem and maybe do some of the, the work there. I don't even know if it's technically feasible. It's, I'll ask Benoit. But, um, but, but 
but to me, that's an example of you extending your ecosystem. Um, so you're talking now about applications and that's an example of increasing your TAM. I don't know if you ever get to the edge, you know, we'll see, we're not qu quite, quite there yet, but, um, but as you've said before, there's no lack of market for you. Yeah, I mean, obviously Snowflake, it, it, its its genesis was reinventing database management in, in a cloud computing environment, which is so different from a, mm. a, a a machine environment or a cluster environment. So that's why you know we're 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 not a, a fit for a machine centric uh, environment. Sort of defeats the purpose of you know how we were built. We we are truly a native solution. Most products uh, in the cloud are actually not cloud native. You know, they, they originated in machine environments, and you still see that. You know, almost everything you see in the cloud, by the way, is not cloud native. Our generation of applications, it, they only run the cloud, they can only run the cloud. They are cloud native. They don't know anything else. You know? Yeah, you're right. A lot of companies would just wrap something in, wrap their stack in Kubernetes and throw it into the cloud and say, yeah, we're in the cloud too. And you, you basically get, you just shifted. It didn't make well, sense. They throw it in the container and run it. Right? Yeah, so, okay, yeah. that's cool, but what does that get you? Yeah. That doesn't change your operational model. Um, so, coming back to software development and what you're doing in, in that regard, I, 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 it's, one of the things we said about SuperCloud is in order to have a SuperCloud, you got to have an ecosystem, you got to have optionality, hence you're doing things like Apache Iceberg. You know, you said today, well, we're not sure where it's going to go, but we're offering options. Uh, but but my, my question is, um, as it pertains to software development specifically, how do you, so one of the things we said, sorry, lost my train there. One of the things we said is you have to have a super PaaS in order to have a super cloud. Ecosystem, PaaS layer, that's essentially what you've introduced here, is it not a platform for application development? Yeah, I mean, what happens today, I mean, how do you enable a developer you know, on Snowflake without the developer you know, reading the, the files out of Snowflake you know, processing you know, against that data wherever they are and then putting the results set God knows where, right? And that's what happens today. It's the Wild West. It's completely ungoverned, right? And that's the reason why lots of enterprises will not allow Python anything anywhere near you know, their enterprise data. We just know that. Uh, we also know it from Streamlit, um, our, the acquisition, uh, large acquisition that we made this year, because they said, look, you know, we're, we have a lot of demand you know, uh, in, in the Python community, but that's the Wild West. That's not the enterprise grade high trust uh, you know, corporate environment. They are strictly segregated uh, today. Now, do, some, do, these, do these things sometimes dribble up on the enterprise? Yes, they do, and it's actually intolerable, the risk that enterprises you know, take you know, with things being ungoverned. I mean, the whole Snowflake strategy and promise is that you're in Snowflake, it is a, an absolute enterprise grade in environment experience, and it's really hard to do. Uh, it takes enormous investment, uh, but that is what you buy from us. Just having Python is not particularly hard. You know, we can do that in a week. This has taken us years to get it to this level. You know, of, of you know governance, security, and and you know having all the risks around exfiltration and so on really understood and dealt with. That's also why these things run in private previews and public previews for so long because we have to squeeze out you know, everything that may not have been you know, understood or foreseen. You know? So there are trade-offs of, of going into the Snowflake cloud. You get all this great functionality, but some people might think it's a walled garden. How would you respond to that? Yeah, and it's true. When you have a, you know, a Snowflake object, like a Snowflake a table, only Snowflake you know, runs that table. And um, you know, that, that is, you know, it's a very high function. It's very sort of analogous to what Apple did. You know, they have very high functioning, but you do have to accept the fact that it's that it's not, uh, you know, other other things than Apple cannot, you know, get at these objects. So this is the reason why we introduced an open file format, you know, like like Iceberg, uh, because what Iceberg effectively does is it allows any tool, uh, you know, to access that particular object. We do it in such a way that a lot of the functionality of Snowflake you know, will address the Iceberg format, which is great because it's, you're going to get much more function out of our you know, Iceberg implementation than you would get from Iceberg on its own. So we do it in a very high value added uh, you know, manner, but other tools can still access the same object in a read-write uh, manner. 
So it, it really sort of delivers the original uh, promise of the data lake, which is just like, hey, I have all these objects, tools come and go, I can use what I want. Um, so you get, you get the best of both worlds for the most part. I mean, it reminds me a little bit of VMware. I mean, VMware is a software mainframe. It's just better than exactly. doing it on your own. Yep. Um, one of the other hallmarks of a cloud company, and you guys clearly are a cloud company, is startups and innovation. Um, now, of course, you see that in, in, the, in the ecosystem, uh, and maybe that's the answer to my question, but you guys are kind of whale hunters. <laughs> you, your customers are, tend to be bigger. Uh, is, the, is the innovation now, the extension of that, the ecosystem, is that by design? Uh, it, um, you know, we have an enormous uh, ISV following and um, we're going to have a whole separate conference like this, by the way, just for, yeah. for developers. I hope you guys will November, show up there right? too. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, you know, the, the reason that, that the ISV strategy is very important for, you know, for, 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 for many reasons, but you know, ISVs are the people that are really going to unlock a lot of the value and a lot of the promise of data, right? Because you, you can never do that on your own. And the, the problem has been that for ISVs, it is so expensive and so difficult to build a product that can be used because the entire enterprise platform infrastructure needs to be built by somebody, you know? I mean, are you really going to run infrastructure, database operations, security, compliance, scalability, economics? How do you do that as a software company where really you only have your, your domain expertise that you want to deliver on a platform? You don't want to do all these things. First of all, you don't know how to do it, how to do it well. Um, so it is much easier, much faster when there is a ready platform to actually build on. In the world of cloud, that just doesn't uh, you know, exist. And then beyond that, you know, okay, fine, building it is sort of step one. Now I got to sell it. I got to market it. So how do I do that? Well, in the, in the Snowflake community, you have a ready market. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's thousands and thousands of customers that are also on Snowflake, okay? So their, their ability to consume that service that you just built you know, they can search it, they can try it, they can test it, and decide whether they want to consume it. And then, you know, we can monetize it. So all they have to do is cast a check. So the net effect of it is we drastically lowered the, the barriers to entry into the world, you know, of software. You know, two men or two women and a dog and a handful of files can build something that then can be sold. It's sort of TikTok for software developers. Yeah, I, I wrote a piece, 2012, after the first reInvent, and I, you know, and, I, and I put a big gorilla on the front page and I said, how do you compete with the Amazon gorilla? And, and one of my answers was you build the data ecosystems and you verticalize and that's, that's what you're doing here. Yeah, and there are the certain verticals that are farther along than others, uh, obviously, but for example, yeah. in, in financial, uh, which is our largest vertical, I mean, the, the data ecosystem is really developing hardcore now and that's, and that's because they so rely on those relationships between all the big financial uh, institutions and entities, regulatory, you know, clearing houses, investment bankers, uh, retail banks, all this kind of stuff. Um, so they're like, it becomes a no-brainer. The network effects kick in so strongly because they're like, well, this is the, really the only way to do it. I mean, if you and I work in different companies, and we do, and we want to create a secure, compliant data networking connection between us, I mean, it would take forever to get our lawyers to agree that, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> right. Uh, it's, now it's like a matter of minutes to set it up if we're both on Snowflake. It's know? like procurement. Do, they, do you yeah. have an MSA? Yeah. yeah. Check. Yeah. Right? And it just sails right through versus yeah. back and forth and endless negotiations. So um, data, data networking is becoming core ecosystem in the world of computing. You know? I mean, you talked about the network effects in rise of the data cloud. And Correct. Again, you, know, you weren't the first to come up with that notion, but you are applying it here. Um, I want to switch topics a little bit. I, when I read your press releases, I laugh every time because it says no HQ Bozeman. And so, where, where do you, I think I know where you land on, on hybrid work and remote work, but what are your thoughts on that? You, you see Elon the other day said you can't work for us unless you come to the office. Where, where do you stand? Yeah, well, the, well, the, the first aspect is uh, we really wanted to uh, separate from the idea of a headquarters location because I feel it's very antiquated. You know, we have many different hubs. There's not one place in the world where all the important people are and where we make all the important decisions. That whole way of thinking, uh, you know, it, it's, it's obsolete. I mean, I am where I need to be. And it, it's many different places. It's not like I, I sit in this incredible place, you know, and that's, you know, that's where I sit and everybody comes to me. No, we are constantly moving around. 
and we have engineering hubs. You know, we have your regional, uh, you know, headquarters for for sales. Obviously, we have in Asia, we have in Europe. You know, and, um, so I wanted to get rid of this headquarters designation. And you know, the, the the other issue obviously is that you know we were obviously in California, but you know, California is is no longer uh, our, the dominant place of where we are resident. I mean, forty percent of our engineering people are now in Bellevue, Washington. You know, we have hundreds of people in Poland, we have people, you know, we have, have a very special location in Toronto. Um, you know, obviously our customers are, are everywhere, right? So this idea that, you know, everything is happening in, in one state is just, uh, you know, not, not correct. So we wanted to go to no headquarters. Of course, the SEC doesn't let you do that um, because they want, they want you to have a street address where the government can send you mail. And then it becomes a question as well, what's an acceptable location? Well, it has to be a place where the CEO and the CFO have residency. By hook or by crook, that happened to be in Bozeman, Montana, because Mike and I are both, and it was not by design. We just did that because we were uh, required to, you know, mm -hmm. you know, comply with government uh, requirements, which of course we do. But that's why it, it says what it says. Now, on the, on the topic of, you know, where do we work, um, we are super, situational about it. It's not like, hey, um, you know, everybody in the office or, or everybody is remote. We're not categorical about it. Depends on the function, depends on the location. Um, but everybody is tethered to an office. Okay, in other words, everybody has a relationship with an office. There's, there's almost nobody, there are a few exceptions, of people that are completely remote. Uh, but you know, if you get hired on with Snowflake, you will always have an office affiliation. And you can be called into the office by your manager, but for a purpose, you know, a meeting, a training, an event. You don't get called in just to hang out. And like, the office is no longer your home away from home. Okay. And we're now into hoteling, right? So you don't have a fixed place, you know. So. You talked in your keynote a lot about, last question, I'll let you go, customer alignment, obviously a big deal. I have been watching, you know, we go to a lot of events. You'll see a technology company tell a story, you know, about their widget or whatever it was, their box, and then you'll see an outcome. And you look at it and you shake your head and say, well, that, the difference between this and that is the square root of zero, right? When you talk about customer alignment today, we're talking about monetizing data. Um, so that's a whole different conversation. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder if you could sort of close on how that's different. Um, I, I mean, at ServiceNow, you transformed IT. You know, I get that, you know, the data domain was, okay, tape, blow it out. But this is a, it feels like a whole new vector or wave of growth. Yeah, you know, monetizing uh, data becomes sort of a, you know, a byproduct of having a data cloud. You all of a sudden, you know, become aware of the fact that, hey, A, I have data, and B, that data might actually be quite valuable to parties. And then C, you know, it's really easy to then, you know, uh, sell that and, and monetize that. Because if it was hard, forget it, you know, I, I don't have time for it, right? But if it's relatively, if it's compliant, it's relatively effortless, it's pure profit. Um, I just want to reference one attribute, two attributes of what you have. And by the way, you know, uh, hedge funds have been into this sort of thing, you know, for a long time because they procure data from hundreds and hundreds of sources, right? Because they are the original data scientists. Um, but the, the bigger thing with data is that a lot of, you know, digital transformation is, is, is finally becoming real. You know, for years it was arm waving and conceptual and abstract, but it's becoming real. I mean, how do we, how do we run a supply chain? You know, how do we run, you know, healthcare? Um, all these things are becoming, are, and how do we run cybersecurity? They're being redefined as data problems and data challenges, and they have data solutions. So that's why data strategies are insanely important because you know, if, if the solution is through data, then you need to have you know, a data strategy. You know, and in our world, that means you have a data cloud and you have all the enablement that allows you to do that. But you know, hospitals you know, are, are saying you know, data science is going to have a bigger impact on healthcare than life science you know, in the coming whatever, you know, 10, 20 years. How do you enable that, right? I, I have conversations with, with, with hospital executives that are like, I got generations of data, you know, clinical, diagnostic, demographic, genomic, and then I, I am envisioning these predictive outcomes over here. I want to be able to predict, you know, when somebody's going to get what disease and, you know, what I have to do about it. Um, 
how do I do that? <laughs> right? yeah. I mean, you go from, uh, you know, I have a lot of data to I have these outcomes and then do me a miracle in the, mil in the middle somewhere. Well, that's where we come in. We're going to organize ourselves and then unpack that, you know, and then we, we work our, we, for, through training models, you know, we can start delivering some of these insights. But the, the promise is extraordinary. We can change whole industries like pharma and, and, and healthcare, um, you know, through the effects of data. The economics will change. And you know the societal outcomes, you know, um, quality of life, disease, longevity of life, is is quite extraordinary. Supply chain management, it's all around us yeah, right now. Well, well, there's a lot of you know high growth companies that were kind of COVID companies, valuations shot up, and now they're trying to figure out what to do. You've been pretty clear because of what you just talked about. The opportunity is enormous. You're not slowing down. You're amping it up. You know, pun intended. So Frank Slootman, thanks so much for coming to theCUBE. Really appreciate your time. My pleasure. All right, and thank you for watching. Keep it right there for more coverage from Snowflake Summit 2022. You're watching theCUBE. <clears throat>